My last name is Lee, Bruce Lee. I was born in San Francisco in 1940. How did Bruce Lee die? The untimely demise of this martial arts icon has been the subject of both mystery and controversy for decades, and many believe the official story left a lot out. When Bruce Lee awoke on the morning of July 20th, 1973, he was an active, healthy 32-year-old. He spent the day meeting with producers about his next film, then headed to a friend's house for an afternoon visit. By nightfall, the greatest martial artist in a generation lay dead on a mattress on the floor. Let's look back at the truth about Bruce Lee's final 12 months and find out the full story of how Bruce Lee really died and what caused it. The Day of Bruce Lee's Death the story of what led to Bruce Lee's death began two months earlier, on May 10th, when he collapsed during an automated dialogue replacement session for his movie, Enter the Dragon. Rushed to the hospital, he complained of a severe headache and experienced seizures. Doctors quickly diagnosed him with cerebral edema, a condition where excess fluid in the brain causes swelling and pain. They treated him immediately with mannitol, and after a brief hospital stay, he felt much better. Lee reassured his friends that this was not how Bruce Lee would die. Upon his release, he resumed his usual fitness routine and maintained his strict diet of vegetables, rice, fish, and milk, avoiding baked goods, refined flour, and most refined sugars. By July 20th, Lee seemed to be recovering well from his cerebral edema. Aside from occasional headaches, he gave his friends no cause for concern. The day of his death was busy. In Hong Kong, where many of his movies were made, he spent most of the day with producer Raymond Chow discussing his upcoming film. Despite the scorching summer heat, he was filled with enthusiasm, energetically acting out scenes. After the meeting, Bruce went to the apartment of his friend, some would later clarify, his mistress, Taiwanese actress Betty Ting Pei. They were alone for several hours before making dinner plans with Chow to finalize the movie deal. Around 7.30 p.m., shortly before they were due to leave, Lee complained of a headache. Ting Pei gave him an equagesic, a common painkiller containing aspirin and a tranquilizer known as meprobamate. After taking it, he went to lie down. When Lee didn't come down for dinner after a few hours, Ting Pei went to check on him and found him unresponsive. She called Chow, who tried to wake Lee without success. They then called a doctor, who spent ten minutes attempting to revive him. Unable to bring him back to consciousness, they sent him to a nearby hospital in an ambulance. By the time the ambulance arrived at the hospital, Bruce Lee was dead. A shocked world wonders. How did Bruce Lee die? Since Bruce Lee's body showed no external signs of injury, an autopsy was performed. It revealed that his death was caused by severe brain swelling, with a buildup of fluid leading to a 13% increase in brain size. Raymond Chow claimed that Lee's death resulted from an allergic reaction to the painkiller he had taken, and the autopsy report seemed to partially support this claim. The coroner officially ruled that Lee's death was due to a second cerebral edema triggered by taking equagesic. He described Lee's demise as death by misadventure, which suggests that the death occurred due to a voluntary risk, even though equagesic was not generally considered dangerous. Despite multiple subsequent investigations confirming the coroner's findings, conspiracy theories abounded. Like other Hollywood stars who died young from drug complications, such as Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe, the public found the coroner's report unsatisfactory. Conspiracy Theories About How Bruce Lee Died In 1975, Bruce Lee's friend Chuck Norris suggested that Lee's death might have been due to an interaction with muscle relaxants he was taking. Norris's comments ignited speculation about what else Lee might have been using. Stimulants to stay in shape or herbal supplements for his health. Another rumor suggested that Lee's death was caused by a violent altercation with a prostitute. According to this story, Lee was under the influence of a powerful aphrodisiac that made him lose control, and the prostitute killed him in self-defense. 
Some of Lee's fans, who believed that Betty Ting Pei administered the fatal dose of equagesic, claimed she had poisoned him deliberately. They speculated that she was working for a secret society that wanted Bruce Lee dead, although no clear motive for such a conspiracy ever emerged. Various other theories implicated groups ranging from the Mafia, Italian, Chinese, and American, to Lee's fans, and even his own family. However, the theory that continues to hold the most sway among Lee's admirers is the idea of the Lee family curse, understanding Bruce Lee's death, why some fans have spooky theories. The legend of the Lee family curse resurfaced 20 years after Bruce Lee's death, when his only son, Brandon Lee, was following in his father's footsteps as an actor and martial artist. By 1992, Brandon Lee was a rising star at 28, having just secured the biggest role of his career. He was cast as Eric Draven in The Crow, a film adaptation of a comic book about a murdered rock musician who returns from the dead to avenge his and his fiancée's deaths in a dark, Gotham-esque landscape. This dark and captivating story was poised to catapult his career, but tragically, he wouldn't live to see the acclaim. During filming in a freak accident, Lee was shot when a prop gun that was supposed to be safe fired a live round into his abdomen. Much like his father, Brandon's death sparked numerous conspiracy theories, even after officials declared it an accident. The untimely death of another young Lee fueled the belief in a family curse. Adding to the mystery, someone unearthed the fact that Bruce Lee's older brother had also died under mysterious circumstances before Bruce was born, turning the curse into a full-fledged legend. How did Bruce Lee die? In the end, the simplest explanation seems the most likely. But perhaps Lee, ebullient and dramatic, wouldn't mind a little mystery around his last hours, a fitting end for the legend who inspired so many to join the fight. We may never know what the true cause of his death was, but here's the truth about Bruce Lee's final 12 months. Bruce Lee was working on films. In the early 1970s, Bruce Lee was deeply engaged in several film projects as he strove to establish a significant presence in Hollywood, a goal that had often seemed just out of reach. Lee was no stranger to the acting world, having begun his career in Hong Kong films as a child. His father, a renowned opera celebrity and actor, undoubtedly influenced and facilitated his early foray into the entertainment industry. Lee's breakthrough in American television came in 1966 with his role in The Green Hornet, his performance captured the attention of audiences and critics alike. One film critic remarked, Every kid in America noticed that guy behind the Green Hornet. The one who could kick. The one who could punch. The one who could move so amazingly. All eyes centered on him. The makers of the Green Hornet had to actively restrain Bruce Lee from being himself because they realized every time they saw the rushes that everything else was wiped off screen. Despite the acclaim, Lee was determined to be recognized for his depth and not just his martial arts prowess. He pursued this goal by starring in several influential films, including The Big Boss, Fist of Fury, and the highly successful The Way of the Dragon. These films garnered substantial attention and highlighted Lee's formidable on-screen presence, solidifying his status as a rising star. As his career gained momentum, Lee became involved in a number of projects, including the iconic film Enter the Dragon. Tragically, this movie was released just days after his sudden death in July 1973, cutting short a brilliant career that had only just begun to flourish. Bruce Lee was only getting started with his career goals. Bruce Lee was far from where he wanted to be in his career. An ambitious achiever, he envisioned greater successes for himself. While just beginning to break into mainstream cinema, he was also working diligently to cultivate his personal brand, aiming to reach a global audience. Though recognized as a martial arts expert, he sought to expand his influence, particularly within popular culture. At the time, 
he remained largely unknown in the U.S. and only truly gained fame after Enter the Dragon was released internationally following his death. Author Matthew Polly, in his book Bruce Lee, A Life, offers readers and fans an in-depth look into Bruce's journey. Polly believes that Lee was just starting on his path to becoming a household name. Bruce had several projects in the works, including an animated show, a clothing line, and numerous film studio offers. He was also scheduled to appear on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He knew he was going to be a superstar and he was getting ready for it, Polly said. Bruce Lee inspired Jackie Chan and hit him in the face. In the 1970s, martial artist Jackie Chan was at the beginning of his professional journey and had the opportunity to work with Bruce Lee. Their first film together, Fist of Fury, gave Chan a first-hand look at Bruce's approach to filmmaking. Chan found Bruce incredibly inspiring. Bruce insisted on treating everyone on set, including stuntmen, as equals, a practice that left a lasting impression on Chan. Bruce would often eat with the stuntmen and engage them in conversation, always willing to help out, even covering medical expenses when needed. He influenced me a lot, Chan stated in 1997. I admired him and the way he would talk. He could even speak English. Everyone thought he was a god. During the filming of a fight scene for Enter the Dragon, Bruce accidentally struck Chan in the face with a stick. Reflecting on the incident, Chan described Bruce's immediate reaction. As soon as the director shouted cut, he threw the sticks down and rushed to me, Chan said. I was used to getting hit. I got hit every day as a stunt guy. I got punched. I got kicked. But when I saw him, Bruce running towards me, I pretended I was hurt. Bruce Lee was trying to carve out his individual identity. In the final year of his life, Bruce Lee found himself at a critical juncture. Although he had achieved reasonable success and was on the brink of worldwide fame, he yearned to be recognized for his true self and break records in the process. His 1972 movie, Way of the Dragon, gained significant popularity, particularly for Bruce's iconic brawl with Chuck Norris, and it broke box office records. Notably, it was the first Hong Kong production to be filmed in the West. Despite these achievements, Lee was still striving to make a lasting impact in the Western world and establish his unique identity as a martial arts genius, actor, and entertainer. While Lee did not experience international fame during his lifetime, his individual identity achieved a cult-like status posthumously with the release of Enter the Dragon. Author Matthew Polly remarked on this transformation, saying, I think when someone becomes an icon, they embody an essential characteristic of humanity rather than being seen as a human being themselves. Bruce Lee became the icon of the driven badass who's almost invincible. He became the god of war. In that sense, he's more akin to Batman or Superman rather than James Dean or another actor. Bruce Lee faced criticism for missing Ip Man's funeral. Bruce Lee had a darker side especially when it came to creative projects, where he was notoriously difficult to work with. As author Matthew Polly noted in an interview with The Ringer, there tends to be three versions of Bruce Lee told. One is what we call Saint Bruce, the hagiographic version in which he is something of a demigod. The second one is kind of the humanistic portrait, focusing on his successes but also his flaws. Polly added that the third version centers on the idea that Bruce could be quite difficult when he wanted to be. For instance, Bruce had Wu Chia Hashiang replaced as the director for The Big Boss simply because he didn't like him. Bruce didn't hesitate to have people removed if he wasn't fond of them. Another notable story comes from 1972, when his Wing Chun master, Ip Man, passed away in December, Bruce didn't attend the funeral prompting criticism from Hong Kong news outlets for his absence. As the founder of Jeet Kune Do and a big movie star, perhaps it was just too inconvenient, commented one of Ip's students at the time. Another teacher who had worked with Bruce remarked, This was definitely a breach in terms of the decorum of the martial arts world. People shouldn't forget their roots. 
It was later revealed by Matthew Polly in Bruce A Life that Bruce hadn't even been informed about his teacher's passing. Enter the Dragon ran into difficulties during filming. When filming began for Enter the Dragon, the crew had to adapt to Bruce Lee's demanding nature. One notable instance was his insistence on firing screenwriter Michael Allen. Bruce felt that the film's story didn't accurately represent his Chinese heritage and wanted to avoid any cultural bias. When his suggested changes to the script were dismissed, he pushed for Allen to be replaced. The movie's budget was set at a modest $500,000, forcing the crew and producers to make numerous compromises. This was further complicated by the fact that the crew was a mix of Hong Kong and American members, leading to initial conflicts when work on the film began. Bruce, fully aware of the significance of this film for his career, was determined to have it align with his vision, which often clashed with the producer's plans. Robert Cohen, who attended the premiere of the film and later directed Dragon the Bruce Lee Story, shared his experience, I was at the American premiere of Enter the Dragon at Grauman's Chinese Theater. The audience looked like they had emptied all the jails. It was the most street audience I had ever seen. This guy came on the screen, this very handsome Chinese guy who could do all this amazing stuff, and people were screaming and cheering like it was a live sporting event. Bruce Lee stayed focused on fitness. Bruce Lee was renowned for his rigorous work ethic and dedication to his health. Reports indicated that he avoided stimulants such as coffee, alcohol, and tobacco as much as possible during the final year of his life. Despite widespread speculation about his health following his untimely death at a young age, Bruce was described as healthy and deeply committed to fitness. In an interview with Fighting Stars magazine, Bruce famously expressed his disinterest in alcohol at Hollywood gatherings, stating, I'm not that type of cat. I don't drink or smoke, and those events are often senseless. Friends revealed that Bruce experienced adverse physical reactions to alcohol, including nausea, excessive sweating, and flushing, indicative of the alcohol flush reaction. He had a low tolerance for most alcoholic beverages. Bruce Lee maintained a disciplined exercise regimen that encompassed various disciplines such as boxing, running, jumping rope, and weightlifting. He was also a proponent of protein drinks and health supplements. Bruce Lee was allegedly cheating on his wife. Bruce Lee's marital infidelity was no secret during his marriage to Linda Lee Cadwell. According to Matthew Polly, Bruce was known to have had numerous affairs, including relationships with actresses like Sharon Farrell. Farrell candidly praised Bruce's physique and lovemaking skills, saying, Bruce took me to the moon and back. He was the most incredible lover I've ever been with. On the day of his death, Bruce was with actress Betty Ting, another of his lovers, a detail that garnered significant public and media attention. Despite this, Linda Lee defended Bruce in a letter published in the Los Angeles Times in 1998. Responding to an article by Allison Dakota G. titled Dragon Days, Linda wrote, I was personally offended by Allison Dakota G.'s article about my late husband, Bruce Lee. She refuted claims in the article that Bruce had died from excessive aspirin use, asserting her authority as Bruce's wife to set the record straight. Linda also acknowledged hearing rumors of Bruce's extramarital affairs, but dismissed them as mere gossip. Bruce Lee was unwell. A few days before he died. It's notable that Bruce Lee fell ill approximately two months before his death. He began experiencing severe headaches and seizures, which led to his hospitalization after collapsing. Doctors diagnosed him with cerebral edema, causing swelling in his brain, and he remained unconscious for an entire day. Following this episode, he flew to UCLA Medical Center for further evaluation. According to Matthew Polly's book, Bruce Lee, A Life, it was later disclosed that Bruce had suffered a grand mal seizure during this time. Despite medical attention, the exact cause remained uncertain, and he was discharged when his condition improved and the swelling subsided. Superficially, Bruce appeared healthy, 
and there were no expectations of further complications. He even traveled to Hong Kong for an extended visit. This trip would tragically be his final return to his homeland before his unexpected death. Bruce Lee was working on his final day. On July 20, 1973, Bruce Lee was primed for a busy day centered around his upcoming film, The Game of Death, and other business matters. He began by drafting correspondence to his attorney about pending deals, eager to see his plans come to fruition. Subsequently, Bruce headed to Golden Harvest's studios, where he engaged in discussions with actor George Lazenby and film producer Andre Morgan regarding The Game of Death. Following this, he met with producer Raymond Chow to express his desire for Lazenby's involvement in the project. After these productive sessions, Bruce visited Andre Morgan's office to finalize logistical details before making his way to the apartment of Taiwanese actress Betty Ting, rumored to be his lover. Later that evening, Chow joined them, though both Bruce and Chow were feeling unwell. Recollecting the evening, Chow mentioned, Bruce wasn't feeling very well. I wasn't feeling very well either. I think we had some water. And then he was acting. Despite feeling unwell, Bruce enthusiastically acted out scenes from The Game of Death during their discussions. As the evening progressed, Bruce complained of a headache and took a painkiller before retiring to Betty's bedroom to rest. At approximately 9.30 p.m., Betty checked on Bruce and found him unresponsive, prompting her to call Chow in a state of distress. Upon Chow's return to the apartment, it became tragically apparent that Bruce Lee had passed away. Bruce Lee left behind a solid legacy. Bruce Lee remains relevant even decades after his untimely death because he was a charismatic superstar who left an indelible mark. His posthumous recognition in the West is a testament to his enduring influence. Bruce not only carved out a legacy during his lifetime, but also paved the way for Asian artists in Hollywood with his groundbreaking approach to martial arts. Many of his fans credit Bruce Lee for sparking their interest in martial arts, which profoundly impacted their lives. According to Matthew Polly, no other celebrity has had such a transformative effect on people. Bruce Lee inspired countless individuals to take up martial arts, fundamentally changing their lives for the better. He holds a special place in the hearts of many fans as a demigod, a patron saint of Kung Fu. His impact was missionary. Director Justin Lin expressed a personal connection to Bruce Lee's legacy, emphasizing the importance of sharing it with future generations. Anything we can do to pass down that legacy to those who come after us, whether through Asian American identity, MMA, or movies, is part of our shared journey as a community, he remarked. Nearly 50 years later, Bruce Lee's influence remains timeless. In conclusion, Bruce Lee's life and legacy continue to captivate and inspire people worldwide. His journey from martial arts prodigy to global icon was marked by determination, innovation, and a relentless pursuit of excellence. Even after his tragic death at the age of 32, Bruce Lee's impact on cinema, martial arts, and cultural representation remains profound. What are your favorite moments from Bruce Lee's career? Comment below and continue exploring the remarkable story of Bruce Lee's final year with us. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more insights into the fascinating life of this legendary figure.